All right, Mary, you are good to go. Hello, welcome. It's Wednesday, September 16th uh, to Springfield, Illinois Facebook Live. I'm Mayor Jim Langfelder. I appreciate you joining us. And again, this is a way that we continue to engage the public. It first started with the coronavirus and uh, how it challenges each and every one of us, how we're providing our services to the public. And it's kind of migrated to uh, different subject matters that have uh, gained the public's interest. And so it's a way to gather additional information and provide that to people that are connecting with the city. And as we go along, again, if you would like, you can enter your questions through Facebook Live or you can do it through our website at uh, feedback at springfield.il.us. And we'll answer as many questions as possible uh, because I think just like last week, we covered the rail topic uh, because that's of interest. We're one of our major capital projects is the rail and the consolidation from 3rd Street to 10th Street. And we had a, a lot of interest, had a lot of uh, concerns as new areas are being developed. And so we are trying to uh, answer those as much as possible. Today's topic is one that's uh, been with us. But before I introduce our guests, a couple items uh, with regards to the pandemic. Our numbers are getting better uh, with regards to that. In the past two days, We've had low positive case numbers of two on Monday and 12 on Tuesday. So it's important that we continue to be diligent. I noticed as we go out more often or as I go out more often, people are wearing their face coverings, especially when they're out in public, if they're in close proximity of others. And then now with the governor's new rule, if you're going into a restaurant or any public place, you should be wearing your mask again. It's over your nose and your mouth. Uh, don't wear it like this or on your chin. It's to have that proper coverage so you don't, um, if you have germs, you don't spread the coronavirus and vice versa, where it helps uh, protect everybody. So it's important we continue to do that, be cognizant of one another, respect one another. And then, of course, wash your hands as frequently as possible so we stop the spread. Because the important thing, and as the providers that uh, will last in a moment, uh, with the virus, it's important that we serve those that we want, whether it's in business, whether it's social service agencies, or whether it's with uh, city government. We do not want to go back to the way it was uh, last March or April or May. We want to stay where we're at right now and move forward. And the best way we can do that is stopping the spread, and there's no vaccine. So the only proven method is by taking those measures with regards to our face covering and social distancing and washing our hands as frequently as possible. So uh, today we have uh, a great group of individuals that provide for our most neediest in our community, and that's our homeless population. And specifically, uh, we ask the individuals that are participating uh, because they really adhere to the difficult uh, individuals that are on our streets. And nobody likes to see it. I mean, it's a generational issue. It's one that no community has resolved and it's one that we continue to try to address here in Springfield. And Springfield's fortunate, just like we have a, a great level of providers, whether it's healthcare, educational facilities, we have a great uh, non-for-profits that do tend to the homeless within Springfield and our surrounding areas. So what I'll do is I'll introduce each person, and if you'd share with us uh, your background and then also your organization, and how you're serving the homeless and anything you'd like to share. And then we'll kind of dive into uh, the impact of the coronavirus that's had on your services and the challenges of providing the services to the ones that uh, you help. And with that, I'll just sell my screen. The first is uh, Julie Benson. Julie Benson is with Helping uh, the Homeless in Springfield. And uh, Julie, I first got to know her actually probably through the media surprisingly, through Channel 20 and that because she was helping individuals around the library when we had a large uh, population of individuals around the library. She would come and drop off meals and so forth. And she has a very giving heart and uh, has really grown to the point where she's actually, um, I don't know if it's called retirement or, you know, this is her full-time job now, a uh, labor of love. And Julie, I appreciate all you do for our community. And if you'd uh, introduce yourself, we would appreciate it. Um, well, thank you. I uh, feel very blessed to be able to do what I do. Um, 
I was uh, working for Henson Robinson for 18 years and um, three of those years, uh, three of the last uh, years, um, I started the homeless, um, the, uh, the homeless project in uh, the ministry. Um, I decided to retire a year ago in February because I couldn't do my full-time job and do my full-time ministry any longer. Um, I was exhausted. So um, I retired, um, my company gave me a van and uh, I was uh, able to grow a little bit more. Um, I've got a building um, that is not published because it's just a drop off site for items. Um, I've grown into this. I have no formal training like you all do. Um, I'm learning every day um, about um, homeless, what it means to be homeless and uh, about individual people and their struggles um, and what it means um, for a community uh, to uh, help our, our neediest. Um, I, uh, over the summer, have um, been helping out with showers and when the mobile unit went away, um, the mayor offered uh, the shower area in the back of the warming center. And so three half days a week, uh, we're letting people come in and sign up for showers and uh, they get uh, clean clothes, hygiene items, and um, we uh, then, uh, to, like today, um, the Taylorville Barber College came in and uh, did a trim, trim up the beards and cut the hair and uh, the chatter in the room was just uh, something that makes my heart happy. Um, I've uh, been very fortunate um, that they have um, accepted me and um, I respect them and they respect me. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, I've got don uh, people that donate meals at night. I'm down to four nights a week now instead of seven. Um, and that's helpful for me to get some other things done. Um, I really appreciate also um, being able to reach out to all of you um, to refer people and to get help, um, you know, for those people that need it. And uh, you all have been very good to me and you've accepted me into your community and I, I couldn't be more grateful. Um, thank you, Mayor, for uh, helping this summer. You've uh, answered my phone calls and you've been there and and helped uh, to solve some problems. You've, uh, you know, were able to do some things over at the cooling center um, with providing extra porta potties, and um, we've got electrical units on the outside of the building now. Um, I'm really grateful um, for your help, uh, yours and Juan's and um, everybody else that, uh, because there's a lot of people in the background that makes all of this work. Yeah, I think uh, you touch on a lot of important points, and it's about uh, the support of the community. And uh, we have a very giving community, and I'm sure that will uh, come through with the discussion. So thanks for joining us. Uh, next is Erica Smith, and Erica has been, um, well, I'll let her share her experience with the uh, uh, homeless and uh, at Helping Hands. But she has a unique uh, skill set with regards to working at both of our level one trauma centers at HSHS and uh, Memorial Health Services, but she's been a great advocate for the uh, street homeless and how do we move them along to the uh, point of housing uh, through coordinated reentry and things of that nature. So we appreciate all the great work you've done for Springfield, especially for our homeless population. So Eric, if you'd share with us uh, anything you'd like about yourself and then also with Helping Hands. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I have to echo Julie. I don't have any formal training in this work, um, but I feel very blessed to be a part of it. And everything I've learned, I've learned from the people who've been on the front lines working in our shelters and, you know, keeping this going in Springfield for years. So I'm really grateful to our staff and, and the, we have a lot of, of expertise in our, our community. Um, I'm the executive director of Helping Hands. Uh, we're in our 30th year. Uh, we do three main programs. Uh, we have an emergency shelter that is 365 days a year. It's 54 beds, soon to be 71. Um, we also do permanent supportive housing. We have uh, 24 units of that, 
all around Springfield. And we also have a representative payee program, which is, the intent of that is to help people um, stabilize and, and remain housed through money management and connecting them with services. So um, our, our mission is to provide the shelter housing and support services. And our agency's vision is that homelessness will be rare, brief, and non-recurring in our community, but we certainly don't do that alone. Everyone here is a part of that. We're grateful for our healthcare partners, uh, law enforcement partners, and, and really we're just uh, proud of the work we do and we're eager to keep learning and uh, moving toward hopefully functional zero for Springfield. And uh, one point I should make is uh, Huge thanks for not only Erica and then also with Captain Jeff Eddy. Uh, and a lot of people might not realize this, so with the winter time, with the pandemic, nobody knew what was going to happen. And they took it upon themselves with their organizations and others. I'm sure they'll uh, state that later on when we discuss in more detail. But uh, they were actually able to quarantine the uh, homeless population with low barrier shelter relief and uh, put them in a safe space where other cities had to rely on uh, putting them up into hotel spaces, things of that nature. And uh, I know Erica, I think spearheaded the incident command uh, staff with re or the incident command team, which was Sangamon County and Springfield's a group that addressed different issues. And in that particular one, she helped champion how we move forward with regards to the pandemic and addressing the homeless uh, situation that we faced. So we appreciate your efforts on that as well. And then Captain Jeff, uh, Captain Jeff is with Salvation Army and uh, they helped uh, run the low barrier shelter last year for us. I got to know Captain Jeff when he first came into town and uh, you know, there's actually two different Salvation Armies and how I finally was able to distinguish it. One is the Adult Rehabilitation Center, which has the resale shop. Captain Jeff's is the one with the uh, kettle at the uh, Christmas time when they're ringing the bells for the kettles and that's how they get their funding. So we really appreciate the support of everyone on their initiative because they have the Clear Lake Community Center that's opened up. They're hoping to have a grand opening, but uh, lo and behold, the pandemic got right in the way of that, but it didn't stop the way they provide services to others. So Captain Jeff, thanks for being here. And if you'd uh, like to introduce yourself and anything else you'd like to share with about the Salvation Army, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, um, I've been here in Springfield now for two and a half years. I've been an officer for 13 years and I've had the experience of being in, a, in two small towns. Uh, we all know Mattoon, not too far away, um, Cadillac, Michigan, and lastly, the Detroit area. Um, I love Springfield. I'm from central Illinois originally. I'm originally from Urbana. So my, I, my heart is here and I love this. Uh, I love the Salvation Army because one of the things we do is we pivot really well. And that's, it's coming in handy right now. I, some people know that the, the rehabilitation center program is coming to an end. Uh, it started in the 60s and, and we're shutting it down right now. Um, it has to do with COVID and, and building and, and all of that. Uh, but, but it's exciting because we're, we're also in that pivoting and we have a, an idea for a program that, that I think will work even, even better than what we've done at the ARC. So I'm excited to be able to tell everybody about that soon. We're, we're getting the final details right now. Um, but some of the things we do here every day, we, we work a lot with the homeless. We do a lot of prevention. We're constantly paying bills and doing what we can. We have a program called Pathway of Hope where uh, we actually bring people in and it's a, it, they, they set goals and then they graduate from the program. And, and upon graduation, that means they're self-sufficient. Um, we do uh, the food pantry about every day. Um, we have our EDS program that also goes into the feeding, um, the emergency disaster. Uh, Sunday nights we've been feeding now for two years uh, and it is partially about feeding people but it's also about the relationship and checking on people and making sure that things are okay and we get a lot of our client referrals from that um, but we've also we've been working with Julie and, and we've been feeding there two mornings a week. Um, we also have the veteran services that does the rehousing and, and, and work with the clients um, so yeah, we've got a lot going on. There's a lot more coming in the future. I'm excited to see where we pivot from here. Well, we appreciate uh, your adapting to Springfield and uh, many programs you offer. And one that you touched on is veteran services and um, Penny Harris Powell from uh, Fifth Street Renaissance. Uh, we've worked on a couple projects with them and actually one was dealing with uh, 
female veterans. I think it's uh, either the uh, only one in uh, Illinois or the only uh, veterans uh, housing available as far as uh, for female veterans uh, south of I-80. I'm not sure which one it is, but we appreciate uh, your great work, uh, Penny. And if you'd uh, give your intro and uh, anything you'd like to share with Fifth Street about Fifth Street Renaissance, we'd appreciate it. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, Mayor. Um, I'm happy to be here too, and especially with this great group of people to talk about um, the services in Springfield and what we're doing um, to assist those experiencing homelessness here. Um, my name is Penny Harris Powell. I've been with Fifth Street Renaissance um, for 18 years um, and as the executive director and um, it has always been the goal of Fifth Street Renaissance to address the needs of our community. Um, one of those things includes um, two programs that we've set up for veterans. The first opening in 2012, um, serving homeless veterans. It was the first in our capital city. Um, and it is um, a very successful program, but that quickly led us to um, understand that there was a need for homeless veteran females and homeless veteran families. And so at the end of last year, we opened a program to address those needs. Um, in addition to that, uh, Fifth Street Renaissance operates, depending on funding, um, 21 programs, um, most that serve the local area, but some that are statewide. Um, and all of our services have to do with either homelessness on the prevention and care side, housing side, or HIV on the prevention or care side. Um, and we, we keep adapting and moving to address the needs of the community in our state as, as they arise. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And last but not least is uh, Josh Sabo, and Josh is a relatively newcomer with regards to the uh, continuum of care, but he's been um, active in the community in different realm, uh, but we appreciate him taking on the uh, role of coordination. And, you know, each agency uh, has their uh, specific area that their expertise, but uh, what really helps is the coordination that Josh has provided in uh, making sure that we have synergy amongst all the groups, uh, making sure nothing falls through the cracks, so to speak, and moving forward in a positive direction. Because as we know, it doesn't matter what business you're in or if you're in government or non-for-profit, we uh, are so busy in the daily activities, um, sometimes we need help in coordinating a broader spectrum. And that's what Josh has brought to the table with regards to making sure we're maximizing our resources as best as possible here especially when it's dealing with the homeless population. So we appreciate uh, your good work as a coordinator of the Heartland Continuum of Care. So if you'd like to give an intro, Josh, we would appreciate it. And if you would parlay that into um, your role as well as um, the Heartland Continuum of Care. Absolutely, thank you, Mayor Langfelder. Uh, my name is Josh Sabo and I've been the coordinator of the Heartland Continuum of Care since May of this year. And uh, that's a new position that was created in our community in partnership with the Community Foundation for the Land of Lincoln, the City of Springfield, and the Continuum Zone efforts, and uh, with help of United Way uh, in there as well. And the Continuum of Care uh, serves our community as the primary HUD designated body. And our mission is to develop, coordinate, and implement long-range planning to address homelessness in Sangamon County. And, and our goal is to reach functional zero. Our goal is to, to end homelessness. And so uh, in the short time that I've been in this role, uh, obviously we've been in the midst of a pandemic the whole time. And I've just been amazed by the work that our agencies have done and our community members have done really to uh, constantly adapt and to, to figure out the safest way to come alongside people and to, and to help them uh, as they're experiencing housing instability and, and homelessness. Uh, it's really been an amazing effort that's been going on. And so I've, I feel privileged to be able to, to come alongside uh, these agencies and, and the people in our community who are working hard uh, to serve those experiencing homelessness. Now, the Continuum itself is uh, mandated by HUD and uh, the way that Continuums work and operate is, is not necessarily mandated. Uh, but our Continuum of Care is a, is a membership-based organization. Uh, we have a board of directors, but we also have over 140 
uh, members who come to the table to implement uh, the crisis response system, which is uh, our model of, of working to address homelessness and, and reach functional zero. And so, uh, Mayor, you've mentioned a couple components of that, but uh, the crisis response system involves coordinated entry. Uh, so a process of, uh, of finding out who's homeless, who's experiencing homelessness and, and how we can help them, uh, but also uh, rapid rehousing. Uh, Erica may, may talk more about that, but there's been an incredible effort uh, along those lines with Helping Hands since the pandemic began. And permanent supportive housing, uh, which is an area that, that uh, we know we need to uh, grow and continue to address in our community. Uh, but it also includes emergency shelter, uh, outreach efforts to go out and, and connect with people wherever they are and to find out how to best help them. And then community education, too, to help us all as a community pull together and combine our efforts uh, to best help uh, our neighbors. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and how many agencies are involved, did you say, state that, with there the over, Heartland Continuum Care? Right. There's over 20 direct service agencies. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, among our membership are, are uh, agencies not necessarily – uh, that are directly housing uh, agencies, but you know healthcare agencies, and really this holistic um, holistic group to to meet the holistic needs of people experiencing homelessness. And as uh, I think on the intros uh, uh, that were given, but you could tell that there's different uh, forms of homelessness or specialties that people focus on. Erica, can you uh, define homelessness, or you know shed some light on? Uh, is there just one definition, or is it uh, does it mean something to uh, different people. Sure. So I think when we talk about homelessness, just a general definition is people who are staying in a place that's not fit for human habitation. That's kind of the most basic definition. Um, but you can make it much broader. So people who are couch surfing or, um, you know, they may not, they may go from hotel to hotel. So technically they have a roof over their head. Uh, we could call them housing insecure, but that's also a form of homelessness. Um, and then when you look at really what our agencies do, um, we are focused on people who uh, are staying in a place not fit for human habitation, but also it's really important to understand the definition of chronic homelessness um, because that's what a lot of our agencies uh, are focused on, on helping people with. And when you look at services and funding and requirements, um, how long people have been homeless, where they come from, um, as far as where they slept last night or the last few nights, really is important for us to know because it helps us to assign them to things that they qualify for and resources that are most appropriate for them. And uh, one of the stats that was shocking, and anybody can weigh in on this, if it's, I'm sure it's changed, but a couple of years ago um, is, told me that uh, when you're thinking of school children, students, that 186 actually has uh, probably 600 students that are considered homeless, exactly for the definition you use, that they may be living with a relative, uh, they don't, they're not on their own, uh, or they may be uh, living in a car, uh, things of that nature. So I'm not sure if that number has grown or not, but I know Penny Harris, when she came to, Penny Powell, when she came to uh, city council, she expressed the uh, concern, which I think we all have with this pandemic, uh, what that might mean with the escalation of homelessness. So I don't know if anybody wants to weigh into that, specifically with the schools uh, or the families, you know, students, um, if that's an accurate count, do you think? And then also the impact of each one of you can weigh in on the impact the coronavirus has had on your agencies and the challenge that you're trying to serve the public that you do. Anybody care to weigh in on the uh, student population? Or is, that, is that pretty accurate, do you think, or...? Low number, high number, it's pretty accurate. That's I, very sad if that's accurate. I would say it is pretty accurate. And I think Penny really leads our homelessness prevention effort. But I think in the months and years to come, there's going to be rippling effects from uh, COVID-19. And I think we're probably going to see more families who are in that situation, housing insecure, which is, as far as uh, emotional or trauma experience, homelessness. Yeah. and. Uh, Penny, uh, yeah, if you'd like to weigh in on that and then uh, let us know how the coronavirus has impacted your agency. And then we'll just go around the uh, horn real quick. We'll go with Penny and then uh, Julie and then uh, Captain Jeff and Erica and Josh on how that's impacted with the coronavirus environment we're in. 
So I, I do think that that number is pretty accurate, but I want to clarify that that doesn't mean that there are 600 children living on the streets in Springfield. That right. means that there are 600 families or children who are um, living with other relatives or not secure mm -hmm. in their housing. Um, as far as homeless prevention is concerned in my statement at the city council meeting, um, we're already beginning to see um, through our homeless prevention program that um, we have, like Eric has said, a rippling effect that is going to occur. It's already starting to occur. Um, people are not employed in the ways that they were before. Um, they, you know, a lot of people have lost their employment or they've been forced to work two or three jobs to make up for one job they was working before. Um, there's a lot of things going on um, and so not only have the calls for homeless prevention picked up, but also the difficulty in being able to serve the people because um, landlords aren't necessarily doing showings. Um, and so that makes it harder to identify property where they can live. Um, it's just been a real struggle and I think that it's gonna continue to grow. Um, we're seeing, you know, um, um, various programs that are meant to help with rental assistance and you know they get a thousand applications and they can serve 500. Um, to me that's an indicator of where the real need is um, not just in our community but across the state and across the nation. Um, how has coronavirus affected us? Um, it's had a great effect on us. Um, it is well first and foremost we have um, had to reduce capacity um, in two of our facilities um, in order to social distance. Um, we are also providing meals to all of our residential clients. Um, and of course that's very costly. Um, the sanitation supplies, the fogging the properties, the, um, the masks and just making sure that people are staying safe is not only um, an effort that takes um, consistent atti attention, but it's also, um, it's a drain on the resources that agencies have that were already limited um, so it's, it's been a tough way to go and, um, I don't see it letting up anytime soon. So we're just going to continue to get through it and, and try to keep people as safe as we can along the way. Yeah. Julie, have you seen a spike up on the street, especially, you know, since you have, uh, focused on that for the year, years that you've been involved? Yes, I, um, was going out uh, different times during the week and then when things started to close like the mission and there was shelter in place, um, I found myself to be out more with the people who were on the street. There were fewer places for them to go. Businesses were shut down uh, indefinitely. They were cut off from the mission. So uh, breakfast and coffee and uh, showers and, and laundry was over. Um, I would, I would literally drive through Springfield anytime during the day or evening and uh, could probably have gone 80 miles an hour and not ever gotten caught. It was scary. Um, and so I've been out there uh, a lot more and, and with regard to that, so I've gotten to know a lot of these people more personally. Um, I've been spending a lot more time with them. Uh, you know, we were able to uh, use the the um, mobile shower unit um, that helped and then we were able to use in uh, the the back room to the warming center that has been helpful um, it's I, I I get almost a new phone call every day from someone um, and of course I'm referring them to uh, agencies uh, trying to get them to make phone calls themselves um, because, you know, people have to, they have to keep moving forward. Um, and many of them have been able to get into the agencies. Um, we, uh, had to start doing food, um, because the bread line went down to one meal a day. So I've had, uh, volunteers ever since April 5th doing night meals, 
um, it's been a lot more work um, because of the um, the shutdown of so many places. Um, and even when a shelter would offer to let them come in and stay, uh, you know, many of these people will not go in. I don't care what the weather is like, they will not go in and stay in. Um, and that's been difficult. So, um, you know, the community and surrounding towns in Springfield have stepped up and, you know, there've been more blankets distributed, there've been more coats distributed. Um, the water and the ice um, over the summer has been, uh, you know, a, a huge uh, donation coming through um, and the food. Um, I mean, we're kind of almost having the opposite problem with the food that, that food is getting wasted and um, so much is being dropped off over at the cooling center. Um, we're trying, trying to get a, a grip on it, but um, you know, the people want to help and that's not a bad thing. Um, we just want to make sure that everybody gets fed, uh, gets an opportunity for a meal. And, and so, yes, it's been trying. Yeah, and uh, one of the two agencies that actually came together in the winter, which I mentioned previously, Salvation Army was uh, operating the Winter Warming Center and then made the decision to move to a larger space. Um, and that was in partnership with Helping Hand. So if uh, both uh, Captain A and then Eric, if you could follow up, on the challenges you faced during that challenge, uh, that difficult time, and then how's that changed uh, how you're delivering services in any fashion uh, as we move forward? So, Captain Jeff? Sure. Yeah, it was quite a challenge. Uh, the thing we saw right off the bat with the warming center was that we couldn't socially distance. Um, with the size of the building, it just wasn't possible. We, at the time, we had 65 to 70 people each night, um, and it just was uh, impossible to keep them six feet apart. And so one of our biggest fears was the minute somebody gets that virus, everybody's going to have the virus. Um, so that's where we are. We really were forced to do something different. And the thought that if they if they're coming and going, then they're going to be bringing it in or, or bringing it out even to, to the community. And so we really had to find a way that we could keep everybody in 24 hours a day. And that just wasn't feasible with uh, with the Madison Street building. Um, so we came together and we did the evenings and Helping Hands did the days and it was, it was fantastic. The, the, we kept the people busy during the day. They would do chores and I can let Erica talk more about that because that was her part. Um, but it, it really worked out fantastic and by the end we were able to house quite a few of them and Helping Hands took the last few and then we were able to shut it down. Erica? Well, and, and to add to that, um, what there's nothing good about COVID. I want to be upfront about that, but I think it did force us to do things that were innovative and think about why and how we do things. And I think we're going to emerge stronger as, you know, um, a continuum and for us anyways, an individual agency. Um, when we went to shelter in place in March, um, what we had to do was keep our building open 24 hours a day as, as shelter. And as Jeff said, that was, um, it was quite different than what we were used to. And then we did partner with Salvation Army and some of our staff went over in the daytime there, um, we started, you know, we started telehealth, um, we started outings, we took people to uh, Jubilee Farms so that they could get some exercise. Um, we started engaging people in new ways and, and working together. Um, it, it was really hard. Um, summer for us, we are still shelter in place. Um, we haven't let up of shelter in place. Um, summer, our, our shelter population always goes down a little bit uh, anyway, but we're anticipating now and getting ready for what happens when we do go back up to capacity. And that's why we um, are making some renovations to our building to increase beds, but also space for people um, to be physically distanced, but also just to have some peace and quiet and, you know, get away from people sometimes. And uh, with the partnership of the continuum, particularly Penny, who is the one who does the application and, and puts in the majority of the work, um, Helping Hands was able to launch rapid rehousing. So we've been able since April to move about, at this point, 25, and we have three more who are going in about a week or two from either shelter or the street to their own independent housing or into permanent supported housing. So, um, you know, this has definitely been a, a collaborative effort. Yeah, I think you uh, pointed out several great items there, and uh, 
And we've talked about a lot, uh, not only within city government, but I'm sure businesses are just like you are, is how do you change the way we do business essentially uh, with the pandemic and going beyond that? How are, you, uh, how are we delivering the services? And you really touched on the importance of partnerships and moving in that direction. So Josh, would you be able to touch on that and anything else with regards to other continuum partners that uh, items that they may be dealing with that might not have been mentioned with regards to the coronavirus and how um, services are being adapted to uh, uh, help others? Yeah, I mean, I would go right along with that and say, um, you know, the work of collaboration that's happened as a result of this, I, I think has been really incredible. Uh, to see, you know, not just uh, agencies and members working together, but uh, seeking out advice from, you know, the health community and other professionals to say, well, what's the, we've never had to deal with this. How can we deal with it together? Uh, but also the community support that's wrapped around too, to say, what are the long-term interventions? What is it that we need to really solve this issue? Uh, you know, the momentum, you know, to really, you know, the understanding, I think, that housing is healthcare and that, you know, we never want to be in a situation like we are now. And so, you know, I think not only have organizations worked incredibly hard to collaborate and come up with adaptive solutions to a, an unprecedented challenge, uh, I think there's been a, an increasing amount of support from the community to come alongside and say, let's put an end to homelessness in our community. And so, uh, like Erica said, there's, there's nothing good about COVID, but uh, the response from both agencies in the community, you know, I think is going to, to change our community forever. Yeah, I think uh, with something as drastic or tragic as COVID, it ha has all of us taken a step back and how can we, um, you know, pivot from that or learn from it and uh, become stronger in the end. And I think that's uh, what we're seeing as a community as a whole. Uh, one question that has come in, I'll just throw it out to the group. Uh, it says, if someone is homeless or is on the verge of being homeless, how can they find out about the services available to them and who do they contact or where should they go? Anybody want to jump in or should I pick someone? <laughs> well, one so, thing, uh, Penny, where, oh, go, go ahead, Captain Jeff. No, I was just going to say, I was reminded this morning of the 211 service when we had to update our information. That's something that, that's a front line. You can get on there and find out where the, where the service is. Um, so that'd be my first, my first uh, advice to someone. Yeah, the 211 is uh, sponsored by the United Way, and it's a kind of an umbrella of organizations that uh, they are a database of services. So depending, it doesn't necessarily have to be homeless services. It could be food services or counseling services or addiction services, and they can point you in that right direction. Um, and with homelessness, it's a challenging uh, uh, for the providers because uh, an individual can be homeless. Maybe they lost a job. Uh, maybe it's mental illness. It could be uh, related to addiction. Who knows? I know one that we've uh, partnered with with agencies as well as Gateway is uh, the Safe Passage program with our police department. Those are individuals that uh, want to get off addiction. I think we've uh, actually worked with at least five individuals uh, during the short term that we've had the program and got them the help they needed through Gateway. And uh, they were actually being able to not only uh, beat their addiction to date, uh, but also find housing in that process. So um, if each one of you really touch on, uh, I know Erica on Helping Hands, you just had a big announcement yesterday with the expansion of your services through the United Way, if you'd like to touch on that real quick. And then uh, Penny or anybody else would like to add to that? Sure. On the uh service. It was, and it, it was completely the uh, support of locally for our funding. So we're very proud and grateful for that. Um, but we're gonna be doing some renovations in our building and uh, they will be done in uh, about five weeks, definitely before the start of the really cold weather. We'll be able to add 17 beds, um, go more low barrier than we have, which is very important too. And um, we'll be able to offer some things that we haven't before. Uh, for example, if there was a dad and kids who needed emergency shelter, we would be able to help them on a very temporary basis uh, that's not currently available in Sangamon County so um, yeah we are excited about that and and what that will mean long term too great and then uh, next uh, with each one of you uh, how can people volunteer especially during the COVID-19 uh, for mentorship or what are your needs do you have a need for volunteer and if we just uh, go with each organization we'll start with Julie and then uh, Penny and Captain Jeff and Erica, um, how can they get involved with your organization and what are your needs? 
Um, well, Go ahead, Julie. I'm I'm a small organization. I I want to stay small. I'm I'm not um, someone, and I'm not. This is not derogatory toward in anyone because we're all different in in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I had somebody tell me you need to decide whether you want to stand in a building and manage people and send them out and coordinate, you know, donations and and this and that, or do you want to go out? And I still want to go out. That's where my heart is. Um, I think I have a niche there, connecting with the people on the street. Um, people are getting off of the street. I will evolve um, as I have to. I don't really need any uh, volunteers. I've got two other ladies helping me over at the shower. So that has freed me up in the afternoons to get some other things done. I run around from the four corners of Springfield um, all day, almost every day. And so that's gonna free me up to do some other things. I've got a lady that comes to my building uh, that sorts through the donations. Um, I have um, people reach out to me who need to do um, community service for high school. Um, and so I'm gonna be taking a girl that's gonna be riding along with me. Um, I still do uh, go speak at schools and churches. Um, I was at a Rotary um, meeting last week. Um, awareness to me is very important. Um, the, the community has, has awakened um, about our homeless people and uh, in return, they, they want to help. Um, so uh, I also like to educate the young people and then also um, people have stereotypes about homeless people and um, I've tried to tell them, uh, you know, we're all different and, and we all have problems uh, to different degrees and uh, they're not, uh, you, know, you should be cautious um, because there is addiction and, and there is mental illness, but uh, for the most part, not to be afraid of them and, and shun them. Uh, they are human beings and, and they deserve our respect and our attention and uh, uh, so I, I continue to do that. Thank you. And then Penny, uh, uh, do you have the opportunity for volunteers or has the coronavirus stopped that or what are your needs uh, as an organization? So and how I would people get involved if you are? So I think that um, even in the face of coronavirus that um, a lot of agencies, including Fifth Street Renaissance, have had to change the way that we do business. Um, the things that, from case management to volunteers to donations and fundraising, um, the things that used to be very personal and face-to-face -face and handshaking and meetings um, has become Zoom and um, socially distanced, and it's been a struggle for all of us. Um, are we bringing volunteers into our facilities? No, our facilities are closed to the public. Um, we are doing our best to keep the virus out. Um, do we need volunteers? Yes, we do. We need volunteers to um, do food drives and collect canned goods and fundraise and um, to, to bring blankets and the things that, and hand sanitizer. And um, we need gift cards to make uh, purchases with and we need cash um, to buy all of the things that we need to operate our agency. So we very much need the community involved it just can't be in our building right now. Um, and I think that that goes for all of us here. And what's the best way to make that happen through Fifth Street? Is it through your website or is it oh, calling or? So we, our website, yes, at www.fsr-sarah.org. Um, or you can follow any one of our three Facebook pages um, to um, know what's happening and what our needs are and to get involved that way. Um, you can call our office and leave a message at 217-544-5040, or you can call my cell phone at 217-638-5045. <laughs> Shameless plugs. <laughs> that was good. And then Captain Jeff, uh, what, are you uh, having individuals, are you allowing volunteers during this period? And uh, what are the needs and how would they help fulfill that? Well, our first, and our first thing is to keep people safe. That's the most important thing. 
Um, and unfortunately, that's what we operated on was it was largely volunteers pre COVID. And so when that happened, it's really it's it's we've had to really adjust how we do things. Um, but the bottom line is we still do volunteers. We're just very cautious about volunteers. We only allow one at a time, things like that. And of course you wear masks and things. Um, there is opportunities to help with food boxes and pantry. That's always an, an issue. Um, there is opportunities to get involved with the emergency services and that can be found on our website as well as uh, the feeding programs that we do. Uh, we, we can still use volunteers for those kind of things outside of the building. Um, but as far as inside the building, we're still being cautious. There's a lot coming down the road. Um, there's a lot more opportunities that'll be coming here soon, I think, especially with these addictions programs and things we're doing. Um, but at the moment, that's what we've got. Now, how about you, uh, Erica? We still, um, at this particular phase of recovery for Sangamon County, um, meal providers uh, still can bring in a meal every night. We depend on meal providers. So um, you can sign up through our meal train, which is on our website. Other than that, um, I would echo what Penny said, for the safety of um, our men, we don't allow people coming in and going the way that we did, um, but definitely providing meals. And to be honest, what we need more than anything right now are are the items on our wish list, uh, which is on our website, and money to um, for additional staff, for additional supplies we didn't used to have to uh, have to buy um, all of those kinds of things. But without the community, we just couldn't do it. So we are grateful. And your website again is at helpinghands.org. Or it's www.helpinghandsofspringfield.org. Okay, very good. And then uh, Josh, anything you'd like to add to that? before I springboard to another question to you. Yeah, no, I would just invite people, um, you know, one of the things we can do as the continuum, if you wanna go to our website or email us uh, and you have a particular way you'd like to help, uh, we're, ha we're happy to help connect you with organizations. So sometimes that's a starting point if you don't know uh, where to get started. And the question came in uh, with regards to a strategic plan as uh, we know the Center for Health and Housing uh, didn't go forward. And I guess uh, this is directed either to Josh or Erica or whoever else. Ha in your view, has any progress been made uh, towards a long-term solution to address homelessness in Springfield? I think Erica has touched on how they've kind of migrated to a different aspect. And then uh, Josh, if you'd like to weigh in too, that's one question. And then um, if you could explain that, how it's progressed since that point in time. Yeah, I mean, I would say a key to that, you know, in 2018, the continuum adopted the crisis response system. And that's a best practice based model that's being implemented across the country. And so the continuum continues to, to evolve and, and improve on that system. Uh, but that is in itself a, a long range plan. And so uh, that's ongoing, that's work that's been going and ongoing, and, and we continue to work to improve that system. Uh, simultaneously, there's been an effort this year uh, to work on a community-wide strategic plan. So to look at, you know, are there partners out there that uh, we haven't had at the table or is there a way to, to, to improve that? Uh, but also in terms of our crisis response system, are there ways that we can improve what we're doing uh, so that we can really uh, make progress to end homelessness? So uh, I anticipate that that, that long-term strategic plan will be taking, will begin uh, at, by, the begin by the end of the year, rather. I, I would say we do. Go ahead have um, you know continued with the approach that that we proposed uh, as a, a community and as an agency I'm um, just a quick metric we use for uh, what we would consider significant progress is on average our agency would shelter about 48 people a night and we had 24 in permanent supported housing we'd like to see that number flip so every night we're housing 48 50 people and we have 24 in shelter so I think collectively and our agency as well just a, a really easy way of how will we know when we're getting there is when we see a decline in shelter population and an increase in people who have stable, uh, sustainable housing through permanent supported housing, rapid rehousing, or just housing prevention and the rapid re resolution too. Yeah, on that, um, if we could, uh, I don't know if you can define the number, how many uh, uh, individuals are within the shelters themselves? Do we have that totality of that number? You know, so all the agencies, contact ministries, uh, Mercy Communities, Inner City Mission, uh, do we have the totality of that number? And then how many people would be on the streets 
or an estimation, that's what someone had asked. Um, I can tell you we don't have a day-to-day -day number of people in shelter total. Um, I did keep that tally for a while uh, with the alternate housing plan that the city and the county had and reported it. Um, you know, when we stopped doing that in late May, I think it was total 60 people in, in shelter, um, but that's undercounting because mm -hmm. some of the shelters don't have to report because of how they're funded. Um, I'd say right now we're sheltering every night, probably, and this is a low time because because of the weather about 80 to 100 but you know when we get into the the winter months and the polar vortex we will see that go up to 150 maybe you know more than that as we kind of bend our capacity as well I think it would be very easy yeah, and how many uh, beds are available any idea of uh, through the agencies any idea on that number or we can get that we'll provide that uh, through the continuum at a later date. Um, what, what about the street homeless? I know we have the, uh, you know, the Dubs uh, Tent City, uh, which is at the cooling center, uh, not the, we want to thank Fifth Street Renaissance for opening up the cooling center. That's been one of the challenges. I think uh, Julie Benson mentioned that the Washington Street Mission had closed and they previously had provided shower services and laundry services. Well, that went away with the pandemic. We had cooling centers around town by different entities and those had been drastically uh, diminished because of the virus. And we thank Fifth Street Renaissance for taking on that uh, responsibility or uh, that uh, help with regards to opening up a facility where people can get out of the heat. And that's at the Winter Warming Center. Well, from that, it's uh, migrated where individuals started um, pitching tents uh, just to the east of there. And uh, so they're just, they're not integrated uh, with regards to that. But any idea of the street homeless population, uh, Julie or Penny, from that dynamic or anybody that would like to weigh in on where it currently stands? Um, I would have to say, um, when I first started doing the meals in the evening back in April, um, people were making 30 meals. Um, at some point I bumped it up to 40 and then 45 and now it's 55. But I know that's not everybody because after I get done uh, distributing the donations, um, sometimes I can't find people. And I have gone and bought as many as 17 extra meals uh, for the night. So I'm saying the number probably hovers around uh, 70 to 80. I would agree with that number. Um, mm -hmm. I know that at the cooling center, um, Last I knew, there was 51 people staying there, and there's a number of people staying at other locations on Fifth and Carpenter and South Grand, and um, so I know that's not the total number. Um, as far as services in the cooling center, we are, um, and of course, we're not using the entire building, but we're at capacity. Um, every day and providing waters and Gatorades to anywhere from 50 to 65 people, 70 people a day. Yeah, it's important, uh, you know, right now we're in September and as we're moving forward, uh, everybody's concerned about the winter and we've had this challenge previously. And I know uh, Salvation Army Helping Hands can speak to this or Eric and uh, Captain Jeff and then Josh as well um, with regards to moving in that direction. Um, we will uh, provide, the city has the resources to provide or cover the costs associated with the Winter Warming Center. And two aspects, I'd like you to weigh in on how do you see that unfolding of the needs? Because the current Winter Warming Center, I always thought that'd be a kind of a secondary space, kind of like what we went through last winter. And then you'd have a larger space because uh, what the pandemic has taught us is we need spaces, uh, places and individuals, you know, to help as much as possible because you don't know when someone might get sick with the virus and then they have or they come in contact you have to quarantine people so i'd like to get uh, if each one of you would weigh in uh, uh josh and captain eddie and erica on your viewpoint of uh, as we move into the winter would we one and then anything you'd like to share um especially with uh, on the winter warming center uh people are asking you know is there i think we're working towards a solution we don't have one yet to be announced but possibly within a couple of weeks. So Josh, if you'd like to start on it and we'll just uh, kind of build on that conversation real quick. Yeah, I mean, this this is something that 
I think many of us have probably lost sleep of since since the pandemic began, or even since spring hit last year. And and you know, agencies have been working hard to figure out how to re, how to address this. You know, helping hands, adding adding capacity, I think is is an incredible step, and and we're really grateful for that. And then uh, with Captain Eddie and Salvation Army agreeing to lead the Winter Warming Center effort and the the continuum kind of wrapping support around that this winter, uh, you know, I think that that positions us well. Uh, to, to meet the need. Um, but there, again, there still are some things that we need to resolve around, you know, the best location to, to hold it. Uh, we know it won't be at their, their Clear Lake facility, uh, but uh, that, that's another complication related to COVID in terms of, you know, how, how can you keep people as safe as possible, uh, manage quarantine space and all those sorts of elements. And so it makes it more complicated to get to a final decision. It, you know, it delays the ability to be able to share that, but uh, absolutely everybody's working uh, together and as hard as possible uh, to open up space as quick as possible so that, that people have a safe place to be. We know that sleeping outside is not a safe or, you know, um, a, a position we want anybody to be in. So uh, we're moving as absolutely fast as we can to, um, to address that. And we're incredibly grateful for Helping Hands efforts and Salvation, uh, Salvation Army's efforts to, to get us closer to uh, being able to move in that direction. Yeah. Captain Jeff. Yeah, I, th I think Josh said it all pretty well. Um, we do have a couple possibilities for spaces that we're looking into. Hopefully soon we'll be able to, there's some red tape that we have to get through to, to secure those. Um, but one of the things that we're really pushing for is a 24 hour space as well. So that in the past we've always, people have left in the morning and came back in the evening. And without the other resources around, that's something that's imperative right now is that they have something to do, somewhere to go during the day. And so I think it'll be a really neat opportunity to partner with other agencies. This is a chance we've got them all together. We can address problems. We can start getting them housed, all of those things. So I, I it, it's, it's too bad that we have to do this again, but I think that we can pivot in this case and really use this as a benefit to our community. So I, I'm excited about that. I think, I think it'll be good. Can I um, say that I'm really concerned for the couples out there. Um, we have had issues with people going into even the Winter Warming Center because they get separated. I get it. Mm. I We've got to have rules. I understand that. But I've already had a couple of people ask if they can sleep in the tent during the winter. Um, the couples, you know, you've got people who have gone through trauma. Um, they're on medication because of PTSD and anxiety and social uh, anxiety and, and things of this nature. I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm in fear uh, for them because even though many people will just shrug their shoulders and say, okay, I'll go in, it's very cold out. I still get phone calls from people that are in little nooks and crannies. They need more blankets. They need more coats. They need more this and that. And and a lot of it are the couples. Um, I, I, I keep that in mind um, when you're trying to find space for people that um, this is an issue. Sure, we we know yeah, that. Eric, you... And it's absolutely important to us that we give the people the best we can. And and our promise is we're going to do the best we possibly can with what we've got. Um, we, we don't set that up so that they have to be separated. It's just the nature of the beast. You know, when you only have the Madison Street building and there's only two rooms in mm -hmm. there, it's what we had to work with. So, yeah, mm -hmm. in a perfect world, we would absolutely love to have separate rooms for everybody. And perhaps that'll work out. I don't know. But um, it's, it's definitely something that we'd like to do. We, we want to give them the best that we possibly can. And we want to make it as an opportunity to be able to better themselves. It's not just an opportunity to stay warm anymore. What can we do with this time that they spend in the shelter? And, you know, what can we connect them with? How can we, you know, can we get them their license? Whatever it takes to be able to get to the next step. Erica, you'd like to add anything to, to that? Sure, we will. Especially 
we will do shelter in place in our building. Um, we will be prepared that if we, God forbid, had to do some um, mass isolation because of COVID that we could here. Um, our continuum also formed what we call a resolve team. So if someone is experiencing homelessness, has to go to a hotel for quarantine through the um, public health department, that uh, we have a team of people, several who are in this call right now, who work together to have an exit plan for that person, um, hopefully to housing or at least directly to a shelter. So um, that's that's really our, our approach. Well, uh, the hour's gone by pretty quick. Uh, we'll probably have each uh, have you on back again, uh, probably when the winter comes and just get an update. But it's been very informational. And if you would just take a minute to, to wrap things up, if you want to share with us any aspect of your organization that people might not be aware of, or any closing comments you'd like to make, uh, we'd appreciate it. So Julie, you want to go ahead and start? Um, well, I'm uh, constantly uh, taking phone calls and texts and uh, messages and, and voice messages from people every day who um, want to help. I mean, the, the, the outpouring of support is overwhelming. Um, but I am also trying to direct them to your agencies um, to help uh, move all of that. Um, I by no means have the space to uh, keep everything that people want to donate. Um, I, I think that's important um, that, uh, you know, that all gets shared. Um, you all have done that uh, with me. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I want to pray that... Um, someday in this town um, that we have no homeless people on the street and, and that uh, we, we can get this down to zero, as you're all saying. Um, and thank you for um, letting me work with you. And it, it's been, a, it's a privilege um, to work with all of you, including the mayor. Well, thank you for being here. Penny, closing comments or anything you'd um, like to share with your organization? Yeah, I just, I want to reaffirm what Julie just said. I think that she said something very important in that um, working with the agencies who are trying to work with the individuals is so very important. That support is so very important. And I mean, the, the reality is that Erica has been able to do rapid rehousing for a long time, but there's no resources. And so COVID has allowed resources that, my goodness, she has housed 25 people in the last four or five months. So imagine if the, if the resources continue and she can house 25 people every four months, imagine the impact on homelessness in our community. So I just wanna encourage people to um, support the agencies that are doing the work and, um, and, and help us help the people that need help. Well, thank you very much. Captain Jeff? Yeah. You know, uh, Penny, you said a couple of brilliant things. One thing that stuck out to me a while ago was the ripple effect. And that's something that keeps crossing my mind. I think it's something that we're going to be dealing with for a while. Um, there's been a, this moratorium on evictions and things like that. We're really starting to see the effects of that now. Um, in fact, as of yesterday, we had 168 people on a waiting list to have rent help. So it, it, it's going to be a massive problem. So I just want to encourage people to support the agencies. You know, I'm not even saying just Salvation Army. Yes, please support us. But, but everybody that you see here, everybody that's part of the continuum, like we all need help to get this massive undertaking done. And that's what's going to keep us from, from going further into the homeless issue and, and things like that if we can keep people in their houses. And so I, and I just want to, you know, really thank the, the residents of Springfield. This is a very loving and generous community. And I've been absolutely blessed, especially after last winter and doing the warming center and seeing the, the meal train and the people that would just show up with things and, and show up with support. And I know we were prayed for every night. And so it was just, it's a real blessing to see how this community responds to need. And so I'm, I'm so happy to be part of it. Well, thank you for being here. Erica? I would just echo what everyone said. Um, we're grateful to be here. We're grateful to work with all of you. And, you know, I, I can see us meeting immediate needs and also at the same time continually striving for our long term strategies and better outcomes for everyone. And at the heart of what we do are the people we serve. And if we keep our focus on them, um, we'll be successful. Very well put. Thank you for being here. 
Josh? Yeah, I would just say comments? one. Yeah, one vehicle for uh, helping to wrap that support around our, our agencies and all the, the organizations is the, the Heartland Continuum of Care general membership. Uh, that, that's not just agencies or people at work and nonprofits, but it's community advocates as well. And so if you go to our website, you can learn more about what that means. And uh, there's monthly meetings where, where we get together and learn about what agencies are doing and how we can support as well. So uh, I just want to put that out there as an opportunity to, to continue to wrap that support around uh, these organizations and agencies. And that website, is that heartlandcontinuumofcare.org? It's just heartlandcontinuum.com. Okay, good. Heartlandcontinuum.com. So Google I really uh, thank there. each. Great. I uh, appreciate everybody's participation today. It's been very insightful. It's been very needed. Uh, I think it gives reassurance to the public <clears throat> of the great work that you have done and the service that you provide to those in most need of individuals without housing. So we can't thank you enough for that. And really, it shows your service from the heart. And that really takes everyone a long way. So we really appreciate your love and care and serving uh, those. Uh, as we move forward again, re of a reminder, the whole purpose where we got started is we wanna progress forward. So continue to wear your face covering and uh, you know keep your social distance, Very uh, be very respectful of others. And you know it's important that we maintain our civility because that will really help us move ahead as one community, which we really appreciate everybody's efforts uh, especially the service providers that came today. And always our goal is to make today better than yesterday and tomorrow better than today. And so hopefully you'll join us um, next week. I think we're on hiatus, uh, I believe, because that's going to be the uh, Mayor's State of the City address uh, through the Chamber of Commerce. But we'll resume uh, the week following that um, on Facebook Live. So thank you. And in the meantime, if you need any information, you can either go to the Heartland Continuum Care website or you can go to Springfield's website, springfield.il.us. We do have a coronavirus uh, webpage that has links to the state assistance, uh, any type of local assistance associated with the virus or other needs that might be uh, within your realm of uh, that you're looking for. So we appreciate you joining us and hopefully you'll join us in two weeks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Mayor. Thank you.